I'm Malcolm Lee. I've killed people close to me and I have confessed to doing it. Malcolm Naden is the modern day Ned Kelly. Australia's most wanted man has disappeared again. He was a man who never wanted to be found and he's a man who terrorised police, families for seven years while he was on the run. Naden said, thank God it's over, I've had enough. Malcolm killed those close to him, those who he grew up with. Life shone in her trusting eyes and now nothing. Letitia Nolan was his own cousin who was giving him a lift to go fishing, is what she thought. But he drove her down to um, the local beach in Dubbo and, and killed her. Just a story that you just, you can't even begin to imagine. Um, and his family members are 15 minutes away. He's out there and he's not handing himself in to let us know what happened. That it just makes you think. His next victim. Again, another cousin, Christy Scholes, strangles her, rapes her, and then goes on the run. And that's the start of the seven year manhunt. That manhunt went for seven years um, and it had peaks and troughs. There was a time where, you know, you'd come into work every day and you'd be watching every police media release that would come onto your phone or, or a tip would come over, you know, at the, at the chief of staff desk and you'd think, oh my God, here it, here it goes again. So to have some new misses, that was really hard to deal with. It got the hopes up of everyone involved, only to, to have them dashed. And there were times there where we thought, well, starting back at square one. You know he's, he's hiding out in huts in the local area. I remember lying in bed in, in someone's house that we'd commandeered for the night and thinking to myself, is, is he around here? because you were part of the manhunt. That was the thing with covering Naden, is that you became almost part of the story because you were right there with police while they were hunting for him. After seven years battling the dense bushland, he became the ghost of Barrington Tops. I slept in the open, exposed to rain, dew, freezing conditions. I was amazed at how quickly I adapted. He was always around people because he'd pick out of picnic bins and things like that, you know, and living off the land, I guess, as well. That's basically how he was surviving. The reality is that the terrain, the weather out there, without any creature comforts of the modern world, is going to take its toll, and it clearly was. Tonight, the capture of Australia's most wanted. So ended the longest manhunt in Australian history with the dramatic arrest of the accused killer. One morning at about three o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call from a detective saying, we've got him. And I just remember, and I even get goosebumps now thinking about that, I remember thinking, what, he's in custody? And they said, he's in custody, get up here. But he actually walked to the door, put his hands up and said, I've had enough. So he knew, he knew they were on his tail. Didn't put up a fight, didn't try and run. He knew he'd been caught. His time was up. The first words out of his mouth were that he's Malcolm Naden. He then went on to say that he, he was glad that it was over, that he, he'd finally been caught. There was a sense of relief. Did you expect that reaction from him? No, no, not at all. They didn't know whether he could even speak. They didn't know what sort of state he was going to be in. And physically, he was not in, in a good way, but, but mentally, he was, he was quite eloquent and he was talking to them. And at that point, obviously, it was just about getting him through the door and into a cell and, and making sure that they had their man. The case against Malcolm Naden was strong, circumstantially, but far from a certainty in an Australian court. When they left one of their many prison visits, they were under immense pressure. They needed anything they could get from him. And what they did get astonished everyone. I always knew that the, that 25 page confession existed. Um, obviously I was, I'd been working with the detectives for years, so I knew that um, eventually the way they got Naden to speak was to, to write it down. It was chilling. It was like a novel. One day they just left him with a wad of paper and a pen and said, well, if you don't want to speak, um, Malcolm, put it onto paper. And they went back to his cell, uh, Max's cell, maximum security cell, and he handed them that wad. 
and they couldn't believe it. The purpose of this information is to hopefully shed some light on the disappearance and murder of Letitia Nolan. It's the confession, 25 pages of it. Honest, neatly written, detailed, brutal. You never really get into the mind of a murderer much, you know, and, and that's what insight that confession gave. Why he was doing things, how he felt in the moment, and I think that's what made it so compelling. It just, yeah, it gave a really deep insight into a really depraved mind. You may think killing is killing, but it's not. I'm sure it affects people differently, both the killer and the killed. The whole process plays out legally. Um, he goes to court and he's very forthright with detectives from the beginning, I want a life sentence. I want you to put me away for life. He did not want to come out of jail, which is, you know, unheard of. I have no intentions of ever wanting to leave prison. This is my home now. This is where I live. And this is where I will die. As soon as the judge looked at him and said, stand up, Malcolm, and he stood up and she said, I sentence you to life in jail. He just, like he just took a big deep breath out and he was satisfied because that is what Malcolm Naden always wanted. He wanted to go to jail for life. Reliving it has drained me mentally. Emotionally, I feel nothing. My head understands the awful truth of what I've done, but my emotions won't engage. Maybe this madness will hopefully be explained. But it'll never make any sense. <laughs>